Welcome to our first recorded video lecture, a virtual journey through life in the universe. We'll be doing 12 of these over the course of the semester, and this is the first one. An introduction to the topic, an exploration of the universe, and we'll end with a question, a question about what is life. So I hope you're ready. Let's begin. I'm starting off here with our intro to SCP-105, Life in the Universe. This is week one. And the topic for this week is life, the universe, and everything. My name's Dr. Joshua Tan. I'm a professor at LaGuardia Community College, which is part of the City University of New York. And I work with a number of other astrophysicists in a group called CUNY Astro that works out of the American Museum of Natural History, which you can see as the backdrop for this video for what I'm looking at. I'm not actually there right now, but they provide this nice backdrop for our meetings and our recorded presentations. I'm going to begin with an exploration of the universe. And what you're seeing here is a journey through space, zooming out, looking at different sizes of space. And that means we're looking at different scales of the universe. So we start on the very top left with a very familiar view. This is the view of the Earth. The Earth is a place that many of us are very familiar with. We travel around the Earth and we explore it. We get very interested in it. But very quickly, we find that we are confined by our planet, that our planet is fairly small in the grand scheme of things. And as we zoom out, we see that our planet that we are on is actually one of many planets that orbit around a central star. We know this central star as our sun, and so do all the other planets in our solar system. And that's what you see just to the right of the Earth. There are eight planets in our solar system and a number of other objects that are orbiting around the sun or sometimes orbiting around the planets. We've even been visited by two objects from outside of our solar system in the last 10 years that have zipped around close to the sun and then left. So our solar system will be of interest to us in this class. We're going to try to answer a very strange question. We live here on Earth. The question we have is, does anything live in any place other than the Earth. And the first stop is probably going to be our solar system to try to explore that question. But we could move outside of the solar system as well. Perhaps we could look at the solar interstellar neighborhood, which is the next diagram on the right. As we move to that next diagram on the right, the sun becomes one of just a many of stars that are nearby. And if you download this slide and look carefully, you'll see that many of those stars have names and numbers and designations, and they will be of interest to us because these are the nearby stars. And the question we might have is, is it possible for there to be any living things on planets that are circling around some of these nearby stars, similar to the Earth circling around our sun? We haven't discovered life around any other location other than the Earth. We've looked through our solar system with space probes and rockets that have traveled to the other objects, the planets, the moons, the comets, the asteroids that are in our solar system. But we've never been able to leave our solar system. 
All of the information we know about the nearby stars comes from telescopes and observations. It's just too far away for us to get to other stars. And we'll explore that limitation more. But that neighborhood of stars that we live in is not the entirety of that all that exists. In fact, that neighborhood of stars is one of billions of neighborhoods of stars in a giant swirling spiral we call the Milky Way galaxy. And that's seen on the very top right of this diagram. That Milky Way galaxy contains an enormous number of stars. It contains one hundred billion stars. That's a very large number, one with 11 zeros behind it. Trying to think about counting all of those stars is a real challenge, and we will spend some time thinking about how we might do that. There's an entire way to describe that, an entire language of numbers that we will use to be able to really understand those gigantic words and those gigantic ideas. But if you think that these 100 billion stars are all that exists in our entirety of reality, you would be wrong. There was a time when people thought that that was the case. That was a time about 100 years ago or so. But at about that time, they built big enough telescopes to be able to see some very faint objects that they then determined were very similar to the arrangements that our own Milky Way galaxy was in. Many of them were spirals, some of them looked like big clouds, but all of them contained billions, hundreds of billions, sometimes even trillions of stars. And there were a lot of them and they were very far away. We started to call these objects with so many stars galaxies. And for the last hundred years, we've come to understand that galaxies are kind of the basic building blocks of our universe. And you can see that there is a local neighborhood of galaxies, just like there was a local neighborhood of stars. That's a local neighborhood of galaxies called the local galactic group down on the lower left. But that's not all that exists in our reality, in our universe. As we zoom out, we can see that that local galactic group is just a tiny outpost in a giant cluster of galaxies that contains thousands of galaxies. And that cluster itself is part of a chain of many clusters. We call that a supercluster. And a supercluster contains millions of galaxies. We can see the supercluster we live in called the Virgo supercluster illustrated there. At this point, we're at distances that are so great, so much larger than what we started at, that we have no chance at all in the history of the universe to get from where we are to the edge of that picture. And we'll explore exactly why that is in this class. But that's still not the limit of everything that's there. You can get bigger and look at the local superclusters. Each one of those blobs contains millions of galaxies, and each one of those galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars. So it multiplies out to giving us numbers of stars in our universe that rival one with 22 zeros after it. It's an enormous number of stars. And that's the limit to what we understand reality to be. It's over on the lower right-hand side of this presentation. It's the observable universe. There are extreme limitations to what we can and can't see. Most of those have to do with the speed of light, which we will start to explore a little bit today and explore even more throughout the course. But it's okay to say that the observable universe right now is kind of the limit to what we can directly observe, directly know about, directly interact with. If we are going to discover life, it's going to be in that observable universe. If it's outside of the earth, it's going to be difficult to find it. 
In the solar system, it might be some possibility of finding if there is any life forms within our lifetimes. Perhaps that's even possible for nearby stars. But as we get further and further away, the chances of finding evidence for life far, far away from us become very slim, mostly because it's so far away. And we're going to get to a sense of how big this universe is by taking very careful note of how far away things are and how much time it takes to get from one place to another. How do we measure these distances that are so gigantic? Well, as astronomers, we have a number of different ways of doing this. We could start off by measuring things the way you're used to, using units like kilometers and miles. And these are measurements that you have come across in your life prior to this class. But when we move into space, we quickly end up chalking thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of kilometers and the numbers become gigantic. So we want to use a different ruler. And the first ruler we're going to come into contact with is using light. Light travels at a very fast speed. It travels at 300,000 kilometers every second. 300,000 kilometers every second uh, is something that would allow us to travel all the way around the Earth 10 times in a second, roughly speaking. That's very fast. But if we think about the next nearest object to us in space, that's the moon, it takes light a little bit more than a second to get to the moon. That's telling you how far away the moon is. That's a pretty dramatic distance. Then we can think about how far away that important star is, the sun. And we find when we measure that in kilometers, it's about 150 million kilometers. Now soon these numbers all get jumbled together. And so what we start to do is we start to talk about how long it takes light to go from one thing to another. We call those things light units. And when we think about the amount of time it takes for light to get between the sun and the earth, we find that it takes about eight minutes. And so a way of describing that distance is by using that fact and saying that there is a length ruler that's the length that light can travel in one minute. We call that a light minute. So the combination of the two words, light and minute, come together to give us a distance, light minute. And how many light minutes are between us and the sun? It's eight light minutes. We can use this same idea to measure even further distances. For example, how far away is the planet Neptune? That's the furthest planet in our solar system. Well, it takes light about four hours to travel from our sun to the furthest reaches at Neptune. That means that Neptune is about four light hours away. We can translate that back into kilometers, if you'd like, but it becomes very confusing. We might say that Neptune is some 5 billion kilometers away, but if you don't have a good sense for what a billion kilometers is like, it's a little bit hard to understand what I just said. So it might be easier for us to describe the distance between the sun and Neptune as four light hours, which is the distance that light travels in four hours. Now, another important unit we have for measuring distances, which we will use in this class, is the ruler distance between the sun and the earth. That's eight light minutes. And that's such an important measurement that we have its own name for it. It's like we give it its own special designation. We call it the astronomical unit. And we'll often measure distances in astronomical units. And sometimes it's such a long pair of words, we'll abbreviate it to AU. So we might say that a new planet was discovered three AU away from the star it's orbiting. 
And that gives you a sense that it's about three times further away than the Earth is from the sun. Now, we've been looking at even further distances than that. And I will give you some examples of some of those. For example, we talked about the distances between our sun and the next nearest stars. And the next nearest star is, uh, it takes like four and a little bit more years to travel from our sun to the next nearest star. So we've jumped from measuring distances in light hours to measuring distances in light years. And you can see how many light years there are on the right-hand side of this image here in a kilometer. We can see that there's 9,460 billion kilometers in a light year, which is a tremendously large number. There are other stars that you might be interested in knowing how far away they are. There's one famous star. And if you look in the Northern Hemisphere up towards the North, you'll see a star that never moves over the course of the night. All the other stars appear to move, setting and rising and circling around. This one star we call the Pole Star or the North Star or Polaris. Now, if we were to measure how far away that star was from our sun, we'd find that light would take 433 years to reach that star, which means that that star is 433 light years away. We might also now ask the question, well, if we wanted to leave our solar neighborhood and travel to the center of that giant Milky Way galaxy we inhabit, how many years would that take traveling at the speed of light? And the answer is 100,000 years or 100,000 light years. And finally, we might ask ourselves, what's the distance to the next nearest galaxy? And we get a number like two and a half million light years. So we are moving further and further away and imagining something taking millions of years to go from point A to point B when it can travel 10 times around the Earth in a second, this is really a difficult uh, idea to have to keep in your mind. But we will try our best to do that. Now, there's one more unit that we sometimes use, and that unit is called the parsec. This is a unit that astronomers ended up using because it's a very convenient one to measure distances. We won't get into exactly why that that's the reason, unless you're interested, you could come to office hours and we'll talk about it. But because you'll see it from time to time, I give a conversion here. I tell you that a parsec is about three and a little bit more light years, 3.26 light years is how, about how far away a parsec is. And sometimes we'll ask and describe things being a certain number of parsecs away as we go out and explore our universe. What we have here is an exploration of the different sizes that exist in our universe. And unfortunately, I can't get this video to play. So what I will do is I will provide you a link to this video, and then you can go watch it yourself. This is a video that explores the largest and the smallest places in our universe, going all the way out to the edge and all the way down to the smallest possible scales we could be interested in. It's also interactive, which means that you can go and you can explore different sized things, different distances to different objects, if you'd like, and see precisely how far away things are. As you explore these topics, you may come up with some interesting questions, trying to describe the scales and trying to understand how you can keep all of these things straight. And there'll be a question on the homework that will help you using this website, organize your thoughts and organize your understanding of how far away things are using this interactive video.
So you got a sneak preview of that interactive website and hopefully you will be able to explore it on your own and answer some of the questions about it on our homework set. As you look through that experience, you'll see that different things are different sizes. And while we're used to that in our everyday lives, out in space, it can get a little confusing. We don't often think necessarily about how big the sun is, but it is absolutely gigantic. In order to describe that, I have shown to scale the sizes of three objects in our solar system, starting with the sun, and then also showing the largest object in our solar system other than the sun, that's the planet Jupiter, and comparing that to what you know and love and have lived your entire life on the planet Earth there in the corner. You can see how many Earths it would take to fill up Jupiter or fill up the sun. And we actually do have some ways of figuring out how many Earths it would take to make a planet Jupiter, or how many Jupiters it would take to make this star, the sun. We often think about these things in terms of how much material is inside of them. And we'll explore the material that these planets are made up of and indeed the material that everything is made up of, living and non-living throughout our universe as the class goes on. But you'll be asked to think about this carefully, thinking about various things like how to measure how much thing, stuff 
and matter and material there is. And we'll use some concept called mass as a way of describing that. But you'll also be thinking about how much space these things take up. And you could measure a distance from one side to another, or you could measure how much three-dimensional space something takes up. We call that the volume. And we'll use some tools and techniques of mathematics to measure distances and volumes and think about how much space things are taking up. And we'll use those same tools and techniques to compare to masses to make some other judgments about how the material is distributed and concentrated and what it actually might be like. So what I'm showing you here is some new, as of the last 10 years, discoveries about planets around other stars. On the bottom, I show the first four planets in our solar system and give some interesting pieces of information about them. How long it takes for them to travel around the sun, how far away they are from the sun. And you can see that's measured in astronomical units, AU how big each of these planets are by measuring the distance from the uh, very center of the planet to the surface of the planet. We call that the radius. And also how massive each of these planets are. We like to talk about them in terms of the mass of the Earth. If you took the mass of the Earth as one size, then all the other planets that we're listing in our solar system are smaller than the Earth. But up above, we see another planetary system with a number of other planets in it. Uh, we can see that there are seven that are shown here. And these seven planets all move around its star, a different star, not our own sun, much more quickly than the planets in our solar system. They're actually much closer to their star. But interestingly, a lot of them are very similar in size to the planets that are the first four closest to our sun. We call those the terrestrial planets. And some are very similar in size to the Earth. And many of them are similar in mass to the Earth as well. So if we found another planet that was similar in size and similar in mass to the Earth, could it be that there were living things on that planet? Well, we haven't been able to find that answer yet. These planets are very difficult to observe. We only know that they're there because they block the light from the star they're orbiting every time they pass between us and that star. And otherwise, we don't have any other information about those planets. But still, we're going to be learning more and more about them. In fact, we know so little about these planets that the pictures you're seeing of the planets up at the top in the TRAPPIST-1 system, those are all artistic impressions. They're paintings. This is not what these planets look like necessarily. In fact, we don't know. This is somebody's best guess. On the bottom, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, those are actual pictures of the planets taken from space but at the top, they're just our best guess. We have a lot more to learn and discover. If we think there are life forms that might be on those planets, we're going to have to come up with new ways of figuring out exactly what these planets are like. And this is just a guess for right now. But one thing we might get interested in is how close each of these planets are to the star that they're going around. But different stars give off different amounts of heat. Our own sun gives off enough heat so that almost all life forms that are here on Earth are powered by the sun. There's a few exceptions at the bottom of the ocean, but otherwise, all of the energy that we need in order to survive as living things comes from the sun. But you can imagine if you were closer to the sun that you would get too much of that energy and you would burn and bake. And if you were too far away, you wouldn't get enough and you'd freeze. There's got to be a temperature that's exactly right for us to be able to survive as living things or as human beings. We call that sweet spot, that distance where the temperature is just right, the habitable zone. And we'll be interested in learning about habitable zones around our own sun 
and around other stars, where the amount of starlight is the exact amount that's needed in order to get to a temperature where things like the living things on Earth can survive. That might not be the only way to get living things, but it might be a nice way to start. Now, if we think about that planetary system that was discovered 10 years ago, the TRAPPIST-1 system, and really start to think about where those planets are, how close they are to that star that they are moving around, we will discover that some of those planets receive about the same amount of heat as our Earth does from the sun. Does that mean there could be living things there? It's actually hard to say. Maybe, but maybe not. And we'll explore why we might think one thing or another. We might guess or hypothesize one idea or another idea. So far, no life has been detected. We don't have the skills and technology or the signals to identify that. But we will continue to look and hopefully at some point discover something really interesting. We talked about temperature, and temperature is an interesting thing that we'll have to use in this class. You have learned about temperature in your own lives, thinking about, for example, the weather. Now, most people measure temperature using two, one of two different scales, either the Fahrenheit scale, most popular in the United States, or the Celsius scale, which is popular everywhere else in the world. The Celsius scale has a very nice feature, and that is that water freezes at zero on that scale, and it boils at 100 on that scale. That makes it very easy to remember what the scale is saying, what the temperature is saying. Because of that, we often use that scale more preferably in scientific contexts. When we are conducting science, we often refer to Celsius rather than Fahrenheit. But you can translate between both scales. And so if you watch a weather report, they might give the temperature in both scales. Or if they only give it in one, you can learn what the conversion is to translate it into the other scale. But in this class, we're going to use even a different scale, one that you may not have heard of before. It's called the Kelvin scale. And the Kelvin scale is related to the Celsius scale in that the difference between freezing and boiling is still 100. 100 Kelvin is what we would say. But the main difference between Celsius and Kelvin is that Kelvin starts at a different zero point you see heat and temperature is related to how things are moving around. And as you get cooler and cooler, colder and colder, things move slower and slower. And when they stop moving, the temperature can no longer go any lower. We call that temperature absolute zero. Now, when water freezes, things are still moving, vibrating around. That's not absolute zero you can get the temperatures below that freezing point. But if you get to 273 degrees Celsius below the freezing point of water, that's at the point where all motion stops, and we call that absolute zero. If we start our temperature scale at zero, at that absolute zero point, then that would mean water is going to freeze at 273, and we call that a temperature of 273 Kelvin. And then 100 Kelvin above that would be when water boils. We call that 373 Kelvin. So the habitable zones we were looking at before, those green swaths you see around those planetary systems, are showing where if a planet was placed and had conditions similar to the Earth, the temperature would be between those two amounts, 273 Kelvin and 373 Kelvin. Now, we'll also be exploring the temperatures of much hotter things because we'll be interested in stars. 
And stars get much hotter than 373 Kelvin. In fact, you can see the temperature range for stars on the lower right of this diagram. Stars give off energy due to nuclear reactions in their cores. And depending on how much is going on in the star, how many nuclear reactions, and really how big the star is, they're going to give off more and more heat um, as there's more and more nuclear reactions. That also means that stars are very different temperatures and the range of temperatures is between a few thousand Kelvin at the coldest end, much, much hotter than the boiling point of water, all the way up to 30,000 Kelvin, which is an extremely high temperature. 30,000 Kelvin is a temperature that can be achieved by human beings in the hottest blast furnaces, but it's something that's typically left for industrial scale work. However, the temperatures that are of the colder stars are temperatures you can get in your own house. You can reach the temperature of a cool star with an electric stove. And as you turn that electric stove on, it becomes a sort of glowing red light. That's the same color that a star with that temperature would have. Our sun is right in the middle. We call it a G-class star. And it gives off a temperature. Uh, its temperature is at about 6,000 Kelvin. And it's associated with a different color than that red color for the star or your stove. It's a little bit brighter of a whiter color, perhaps a yellowish light. And the very hottest stars, the ones that are at 30,000 Kelvin, are listed here as being very blue. And indeed, they give off a lot more blue light. We have actually, as astronomers, given different letters for each of these kinds of stars, and they're listed there. We'll talk more about it when we learn more about stars later in the class. But now we're going to think about not just temperature and size and mass and space, but how much time it, we have. There's actually a limit to the amount of time that the universe has been around. It took us some many decades to figure this out, but we actually do know that the universe has been around for about 13.8 billion years. Now, life has been on our planet Earth for a very long time, but to the best estimates that we have, it's between about three and a half and four billion years that living things have been on planet Earth. So the universe has been around for a lot longer than life on Earth. The planet Earth itself is a little bit more than four and a half billion years old. So planet Earth formed well into the history of our entire universe. Many, many things happened before Earth even came around. Now, because we're talking about billions of years, it gets a little bit confusing for some people. So what we sometimes do to help us think about the passage of time is we compress the entire history of the universe into one year. We call that the cosmic calendar. On January 1st, that's the moment of the Big Bang. That's the moment when the universe began. And December 31st at 1159 PM is right now. And everything in history, everything in the entire universe that has ever occurred and happened, every event, every formation, everything that we're going to be learning about happened in that year period. Well, it was 13.8 billion years, but we have shrunk it down into one calendar year. And you can see here on this calendar that they've put some major milestones in our universe on it. For example, our Milky Way's disk where we live formed in about May, and that's about halfway through. So perhaps some nine or 10 billion years ago is when the Milky Way disk formed. The origin of our solar system happens in September. Now I told you that was four and a half billion years ago, but when you shrink it down to a calendar, that means that it was in about September when the Earth formed, and the Sun as well. They formed at about the same time. 
life shows up very soon thereafter. And different forms of life start to show up in October and November and December. You don't get life with more than one cell until December. That's called multicellular life. So the month of December becomes very interesting on the cosmic calendar. That month of December represents um, approximately a billion years or so of existence. And that's sort of the billion years where we show up and our ancestors and everything on earth that we've kind of been interested in shows up. So you can see that there's the first week of September, the second week of September, or sorry, of December, the first week of December, the second week of December. And we finally start to see some fossils from about halfway through that month. And then suddenly things start to show up. We see that reptiles appear on the 23rd of December. The dinosaurs appear on the 25th of December. The dinosaurs go extinct on the 30th of December. And then on the final day, we finally have the mammals start to do their thing, start to live on our planet Earth. This is a short period of time, some tens of millions of years compared to the entire history of our universe. But then you can see when human beings first show up, they really start to show up at, you know, later on in the evening on December 31st. And modern human beings, the ones that are identified as homo sapiens sapien, us, don't show up until 1152. Human beings don't leave Africa until 1156, four minutes before midnight. And we're getting close to that point of midnight and we take the final minute and all of human history occurs in that final minute, from the first cave paintings to Egypt, to the fall of the Roman Empire, to what we're doing right now. Now you're gonna use this idea, this cosmic calendar to think about times and different events that have happened in our past. We're gonna to try to think about this in a very big way, but using a one-year calendar makes it a little bit easier to do. And finally, we're going to ask ourselves a question. What makes something alive? You'll read an article that tries to describe some of the characteristics of living things. And these living things are going to be important because we'll ask ourselves which type of living thing is going to be most likely to be found, if one will be, outside of the Earth. Not everybody agrees. You can see on the left, one person, this is Randall Monroe, who writes a famous web comic, his idea about what makes some things alive and what makes some things not alive. And he's got a border between two things you may not have heard of before. They're called viruses and prions. Viruses are uh, things you have heard of. They've been very important in our lives, but prions are things you may not have heard of. They are uh, implicated in certain diseases most famously mad cow disease. But people have argued whether they're alive or not because they really are just a coating of protein. They don't seem to have a lot of the characteristics of living things. Some people argue that they might be alive. Some people argue that they're not. Randall Monroe says prions are not alive, but says viruses are alive. Well, there's another person that has made a chart up in the upper right hand, which said that viruses aren't alive don't consider viruses to be alive because they don't do a lot of the things that other living things do. They don't have cells, for example. They call these acellular things, things that are not living. But that's an argument. There is no right or wrong to this argument. You have to actually go ahead and think carefully and make the argument. And you can see on the bottom another attempt to describe some things that are alive and some things that aren't alive. This one was from a children's textbook. This is something we're going to have to do. We're going to have to think about what makes things that are living and what makes things that are not living. And you'll have a homework question that asks you to look through some of the vocabulary we associate with that question. So that's what we have in store for ourselves. That's what we're going to be looking for. I hope you're going to enjoy going on this journey with me. I thank you for paying attention. Please do open that homework set. Look carefully at the questions, try to answer them. And I look forward to our next meeting, uh, week two, 
where we'll start talking about the building blocks of material and matter, atoms, molecules, chemicals, and so forth. 